Hi everybody, I am Bengt Viberius, news innovator and also the representative for the crowd movement hashtag EU for snooze. Beside me I have a very important person. All the way from New Zealand, let me present Professor Mareva Glover. Welcome to Sweden. Oh, thank and you. On my left side, I have Mr. Atakan Befritz of INCO and the New Nicotine Alliance of Sweden. Uh, Mareva, could you present yourself a little bit more in detail for the international audience? Okay, I've been uh, working in tobacco control for 25 years and I've just recently opened my own centre of research excellence looking at indigenous sovereignty and smoking and that's a global programme. I'll be looking at smoking among all indigenous people in the world. It's quite a big programme. Yeah, right. Maybe not everybody know what indigenous means. The people who were in a country and uh, you know, had sovereignty or governance over that land before they were colonized or other people moved in and, like uh, and the became, Indians of North America. Yes, First Nations, Canada, first uh, the Aboriginal people in Australia, Māori in New Zealand, which I am. And of course you have the Sami here in Scandinavia. We have the Sami population up in the north of Sweden, uh, that's correct. Uh, now I must ask you a serious question. Are you a smoker? No, I, I was a smoker. You were? A yes, smoker. Uh, very young. Uh, we, you know, we used to have very early uh, smoking starting age and uh, many Māori smoked. We actually many still do smoke. So 42% of Māori women smoke. And, uh, 38% of men, so we're still very, very high, and that's much higher than the dominant population. All right, all right. So you're a former smoker. Yes. I and guess. I'm a former smoker. And I'm a former big time smoker. <laughs> yeah. I was not a big time smoker. I was only a light smoker, but I got sick very early on. Yeah. So I. But do you use any kind of nicotine for recreational purposes? No, I don't. I know well, there, there were, wasn't anything back then. Um, I do have a vaporizer, but no nicotine in it, just so I can show people how to use it. All right. Good. Why have you heard of Swedish snus? I have. I've known about uh, Swedish snus for a long time. Uh, I used to work with. Dr. Murray Logerson in New Zealand, and he knew about it. Uh, the reason why we don't have it in New Zealand is because we have a historical law that banned chewing tobacco, and it dates right back to stopping people spitting. Yeah. So that had carried through and was put into our Smoke Free Environments Act in 1994, uh, banning chewing tobacco. And Murray's uh, assessment later on, when we found out that Sweden was having reduced harm, lower rates of morbidity and mortality from smoking, people were switching to snus. Murray believed that snus wouldn't take in New Zealand because it was culturally specific to Swedish men. But uh, with the new law, we, are, we will be coming back to what has happened in New Zealand, who has made a sort of an 880 degree turn with regards to tobacco harm reduction. But uh, I know for a fact that snooze now have started to sell because it's still in the grey zone. Yes, it is a grey zone. Uh, do you think snooze is a good alternative to cigarettes? Absolutely, yep. Uh, cigarettes harm. We know that. There's plenty, plenty of evidence that uh, if you smoke, one of the best things you can do for your health is give up smoking. If you can't quit smoking altogether, then, you know, now, and we didn't have this before, although you did, you had snus, we didn't. Yeah. But now we have electronic cigarettes, vaping, heat not burn products, and of course, snus yeah you know and, and there is enormous amount of data on snus showing that it, it is also a risk reduced product right i guess we have a, a 
we have a, a large set of uh, uh, nationwide uh, evidence supporting that snooze can actually help a population quit smoking. Well, it's really the reduced harm. Yeah. So, you know, in New Zealand, Murray and I, early on, tobacco control was focused on reducing the diseases and yeah. the early death. Uh, tobacco control lately, maybe in the last 10 years, has switched completely away from caring about that to just getting rid of tobacco companies. So it's, a, it's created some problems. Mm. But really what we should be looking at is the harm that's caused and reducing that. Thank you. Um, since 1992, SNUS has been banned in the European Union. The uh, European Union has about 100 million smokers today. Do you support an end to the EU SNUS ban? Uh, it's madness to ban SNUS when so many people still smoke. And in Scandinavia, well, Sweden and Norway now, you've shown that you can reduce smoking prevalence. <laughs> It's, it's madness. It's, it totally should be uh, able to be available to smokers all around the world. Yeah. In your opinion, how could an end uh, to the EU snooze ban benefit some of the European Union's 100 million smokers? If, if the ban was uh, lifted, and I mean really what smokers need worldwide is access to a full range of risk-reduced products mm. because not everything is going to work for everybody, like not one product. We're finding that in New Zealand uh, we have embraced vaping and encouraged people to vape. Uh, even the government, the Ministry of Health is encouraging of people who work. you can't quit if the other products haven't worked, switch to vaping. And uh, some people just, it just doesn't work for them. So yeah. I, I think we need SNUS as well. We need the full range of products. This is a very important question. I guess the whole world might be asking themselves this question. Why do you think many politicians ignore uh, the scientific facts of SNUS or e cigarettes for that matter? I think that people are being confused deliberately so I think that people are being confused deliberately so there's a lot of information out there that's deliberately put out to mislead people and so when a scientist comes naive to the data they find studies for and they find studies against they find arguments for and they find arguments against the Many of the arguments against are manufactured. They are this studies that are done, they are not robust, and they are deliberately done to create false evidence. So this is confusing for people. And it's really, really difficult now to determine what is the truth. Somebody would need to spend a lot of time reading way back, you know, back past 2000, back many years through the literature and analyze it from scratch to get to the truth. Right, but do we actually need to get to the 100% truth if we know for 100% sure that some products are considerably less harmful than smoking some? Only some people know that, and the ones who don't know that don't know who to believe because the ones who are against SNUS uh, are saying we know 100% that it is bad. So there's basically this fight for truth, mm. and there's a lot of misinformation, and there's good information that people should be listening to, but people don't have the time, they don't. They don't want to look at all of that research and it comes down to who should they believe and uh, this is a major problem not just for SNUS no. but across science on yeah. many many issues. Um, it's a information overload and there are lies and there, are, there is good evidence and good support for things. You were talking about uh, uh, lies and fabricated 
evidence. Uh, Atakan, yes. you were in the uh, European Court of Justice uh, during the trial. Uh, I was happy to be there as well, as well as Uwe Hille from the first years. Did you hear any fabricated lies? As I put out in a tweet that evening, I started jotting down and I took furious notes during the whole oral presentations from from the different governments, let's not name them, but I actually stopped counting at 82 during that, during that day. And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, which I do in this case, I also took a lot of notes, about 30 pages. Uh, someone said from the EU, one of the EU organs, that the reason for Sweden uh, almost quitting smoking it's not due to snooze, it's due to paternity leave. And that is that was actually uh, the general advocate for the parliament, I think, and she is she is from Sweden. She's a Swedish woman, so it is my view that she knows better and should know better. Uh, and another reason for Sweden going smokeless among men at least is that uh, the healthy living style of Swedish men. Uh, you can you can just watch uh, this, and uh, I I do have a beer sometimes also, so I don't think really that has anything scientific to do uh, with with the smoking cessation. People are not going back far enough in the evidence, and you know I've seen student work where if they do a literature review they only go back to 2000. Yeah. So, and what about the 50 years of research on tobacco and snuff and everything before that? Yeah. So it's a major problem. There's a breakdown in the academy in science, and and it's having a spill-on effect into these kind of topics. I uh, I did read uh, just lately uh, a survey, a major survey, saying that. Only 20% of a European, I think it was the European population, thought that uh, e-cigarettes are less unhealthy than smoking. Some even believed e-cigarettes was more harmful than smoking. 20%. And the same type of a vast uh, consumer survey in the United States uh, published uh, tweeted by uh, Professor Brad Rodo, and it was FDA financed. The FDA survey asked, uh, do you believe that smokeless tobacco could be less harmful than smoking? And only 11% of the US uh, respondents answered the correct answer. Yes, smokeless tobacco is yeah, could be less harmful than smoking. So we have a gigantic information gap. Because I'm sure the FDA and the tobacco control organs, even the European Union, knows that e-cigarettes and snus and heat, heated products are considerably less harmful, at least less harmful than smoking, and still they don't inform the public about this. I oh, know the public are well informed, they're just misinformed. Yeah, so. but they are not informed on the front page of FDA or the European Union. It doesn't say if you are a nicotine dependent, these products are less harmful. Well, it's, it says it on the Ministry of Health website. All right, well, who, who can find it? <laughs> yeah. To make it more public, that was my suggestion. <laughs> no, I think that the, the people and organizations who are against uh, vaping and snus and heat not burn, uh, you know, they are putting out a lot of information. It, it's prolific. Every day there's another fake study and another fake you know, news release and the media love it um, and they, they put it out on the front page so the public are largely being misinformed quite deliberately. Quite deliberately, I agree. Uh, 
can you briefly elaborate uh, uh, on uh, how and why the New Zealand government has made a sort of a 180 degrees turn on products of harm reduction, such as ESICs and heated products and so on? One of the main things was that smoking wasn't coming down fast, as fast among the Māori, the indigenous population, yeah. also among our Pacific Island population. So their smoking rate has just been the same for 10, years, 10 years, 25%, yeah. no change, despite crushing taxes, shaming, stigmatising campaigns, uh, expanding smoke-free environments to outside, at the beach, in the park. Yeah. Um, nothing was working anymore. So something else had to happen. And then vaping came along. A lot of Māori began to switch to vaping. And so really it was the consumers embraced vaping and began to take up vaping. It began to spread. Uh, the academics then, some of them began to go, we should ban this. But it was like, well, well why would you ban it? People are stopping smoking. Yeah, so, I you mean, should rejoice. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, the, the majority in New Zealand are like, that doesn't make any sense to ban something if actually when so many people are switching over, they've stopped smoking. And then uh, the government looked at the evidence and they also you know, concluded this is something that will actually help us. Um, so how can other governments uh, benefit from the change, the great change in New Zealand? Well, other governments need to actually have policy analysts that will actually read the evidence yeah. and not be uh, lazy, uh, lazy, uh, really. Right. Yeah. And then the problem is politicians are being lobbied very, very hard. The people against vaping, against snus, against heat not burn are banging on those doors every week. They are trying to get in and see politicians and fill politicians' heads with rubbish. So it's a huge problem. On Heat Not Burn, uh, New Zealand was going, said it was banned, and uh, the ministry took Philip Morris to court and yeah. lost. They right. lost. Right. So, so Heat Not Burn's illegal. And the implications of that judge's ruling, I believe, is that SNUS is also legal in New Zealand. Yeah. However, the ministry have said no, SNUS is still banned. What the judge said was that the heat sticks for the ICOS are not an oral tobacco product, which the ministry was using to ban them, yeah. because it's not for chewing. And I went, neither is SNUS for chewing. Yes. <laughs> so therefore... Have you seen me chew? Yeah. <laughs> have you seen me chew? <laughs> so SNUS therefore could also be, in fact, never have been banned, and the law is not clear enough. Unfortunately, um, I think in the coming legislative change, there will be a lot of pressure on the government to clarify and ban SNOOS. I wouldn't like to see that happen. Um. We will need your help. <laughs> to convince people that what has happened in Sweden and Norway yeah. is uh, a good also in also in Iceland. Also in Iceland, Iceland. very much. Iceland and, uh, well. uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but Finnish youth, the smoking rates are dropping dramatically. But they go across the border yeah. and buy snooze, yeah. which is still better than yeah. smoke. A very immediate question that involves actually the whole world, and, and uh, that is flavors. How can availability of different choices of flavors in E6 and SNUS, for example, contribute to more people managing to quit smoking? So one, one of the issues is that smoking tobacco, that has been the most sort of dependency forming way of using nicotine. Uh, when people switch to um, vaping uh, and heat not burn, and heat not burn is a good example because it is weaker, it's weaker and I've just been to Japan and for people switching over from smoking, some people find it's the heat not burn is not as good, 
So one of the users said to us that what he did, he switched to a mint flavored heat stick. He didn't use to smoke menthol. He switched to mint and that helped and kind of compensated a bit for the weakness of the new product. So it's the flavor adds another uh, aspect to the more aspects you have, the opening the packet, you know, the, the hand-to-mouth movements, the sensory aspects, and, and the, the flavor. It adds... And your scent, I guess. Yes, the smell and the, the taste. It adds to the experience. And if something has less experience, less reward, is weaker than smoking yeah. tobacco. It's important to help people switching over that. The flavor is incredibly important. I'm totally against banning the flavors. Right. In tobacco, uh, in, in this heat, of, heat not burns, snus, or vapors, that would be another thing that would undermine the success of people switching over. Uh, the, the success rate would most definitely be affected, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, if we only, we are modern people, we are normally uh, used to having a variety of everything. Having choice. If you would compare smoking of traditional cigarettes to using Swedish news uh, or e-cigarettes, if you have a sort of a risk scale, uh, something like this, uh, going from 100% to zero percent risk, where we, if we assume that smoking, uh, in this example, is hundred percent risk, where would you place, uh, for example, e-cigarettes? Uh, so basically, way down here, and so the estimated risk against smoking of e-cigarettes is at five percent. Yeah. And the estimated risk of Swedish snus is is about it's estimated at about two percent. Two percent. Two percent of the risk. So much much safer, yeah. basically. And heat not burn is a little bit further up, but still, you know, once you stop breathing in smoke, then you've cut most of the harm uh, yeah. causing constituents. So get down the scene quick. I guess this is what they call moving down the risk continuum. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I will say this <laughs> on my wall. <laughs> Last month in August, me and Atakan here uh, visited a presentation, a doctor's thesis at the Danderyd Hospital Karolinska under the governance of the Karolinska Institute. During the final discussions, a professor Gunilla Bolinder of the Karolinska Institute uh, stated that, I have to read uh, so I get this quote exact, they are working now on the harm reduction. They just touch on that and this is a huge problem because we should as scientists be more interested in the comparison between non-users of a drug and users of a drug that have the worst side of exposure but you must always compare with the non-users she basically say that you shouldn't care about anything in between white and black on, on, on a scale do you agree that there is something wrong in comparing reduced harm with worst harm in addition to comparing reduced harm with no harm? I think this is a good example of how the academy, universities worldwide and science is breaking down. We have people who are now professors who make statements like that. Yeah. And, uh, we should be studying everything, yeah. but particularly when we're concerned about reducing the rates of lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, you know, the main uh, 
preventable causes of illness from smoking and tobacco. And we now have a range of products that can do that, and that can reduce that harm. We want, we want to understand the continuum the, of harm. The yes. whole range That's between, right. from the most deadly uh, products down down this, uh, this, the whole scale. Yes, that's right. We want to understand all of it. And, of course, you would want to also know, you know, uh, what's the difference between these and no use. Uh, but the most important thing is reducing the rates of lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, uh, and a number of the other smoking related yeah. you know, diseases. That's what's really important. Some, the thing is when you start focusing on something that really doesn't cause a lot of harm. For a small country like New Zealand, for example, with a small health budget, yeah. you need to prioritise. There's always an opportunity cost. And all of the effort going into running around creating alarm about something that really is not a public health issue. There are far bigger public health issues mm. and the funding should be rerouted to deal with those. Get people off smoking and then we need to deal with obesity and alcohol. Many other issues are far more important, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Your opinion is that this is uh, really uh, not very scientific to just focus on those who smoke and those who don't at all. We, ha we have in the world 1.2 billion smokers, I think, and according to the World Health Organization, uh, they, the smoking habits of these 1.2 billion people incur a, a, a total uh, health cost or production loss cost for the world society of about two trillion dollars, American dollars. How could it be so impossible for, for some parts of the science and, and universities to grasp that it must be totally impossible, even with all the BNP, all the money in the world, you could never get 1.2 million billion smokers to quit cold turf. Uh, There's a lot of reasons why uh, people are against uh, harm reduction. Harm reduction is is going to save money, but in order to get the harm reduction, you need people to stop smoking. As people stop smoking, you get less tax income. So, as I said, I've just been to Japan, and this is something that the Minister of Finance is concerned about. Mm. So, when heat not burn products were introduced, they had 27% drop in the tobacco market as people, mass exodus yeah. of smokers to the heat not burn products, which were not taxed at the same rate. So, the Japan government. Uh, got a bit of a shock and they, they realised that this, this is a disaster, the amount of funding that they will lose. And, um, and our acting Prime Minister, uh, Winston Peters, he has also identified that the loss of taxes as smokers switch or stop yeah. is a, a bit, going to be a bit of a problem for New Zealand. We, he said we're just not going to be able to afford to do many of the other programs government want to do. So, but on the other hand, in in the in in accounting, there's always a debit and a credit. Uh, tax revenues from from selling cigarettes uh, brings income, but then you have. The debit, which is the Sweden, health cost. Sweden, Sweden has an interesting take on that because we've done some math. And we have approximately 11 billion in tax revenue from cigarettes. Mm -hmm. We calculate costs at 31 billion. Yeah. For snows, we have a considerably lower revenue, which is 3 billion. But on the other hand, we cannot find any costs at all. And the savings from the lower smoking is not factored into that. So that would probably mean a massive hidden save. But we also have a sort of a, a national, uh, uh, worldwide, uh, I'd say, ethics 
because who considers someone catching lung cancer from smoking perhaps affecting for sure that his or hers whole family productivity uh, sick leave which cost the employer and the society a lot of money but, but most of all the suffering of this person how can you you can't quantify that yeah. in uh, in dollars or Swedish krona. So this this is another area in public health. We haven't really had consideration of ethics. Yeah. So public health ethics as a discipline is actually only a new discipline and only beginning to look at this and question the stigmatizing campaigns, the shaming of people, uh, and the so it's really a new literature. Right. So we've been operating for maybe 35 years without consideration of those kinds of questions. But, but uh, do I understand you correctly? These concerns should be also focused on. Uh, absolutely. Right. It is not ethical to run a campaign, for example, a, uh, a stigmatizing campaign about someone who smokes. Uh, that if, even if it harms one person, even if you destroy that person's well-being or cause them to be socially isolated uh, from their peer and family group, for instance, mm. because of that stigmatisation. I mean, in New Zealand we have people openly abuse women on the street if, if they're visibly pregnant and smoking. People feel absolutely justified going out and having a go at it. This is not okay. So, um, should instead focus on, on uh, helping these people. Help. We need to help people, and we need to uh, be. We need to have ethical, ethical. Uh, we need Wait. to have respect for people's dignity. Yeah. And um, I was really interested in Japan. They do not approve of the whole shaming, stigmatizing thing. It's culturally not appropriate to shame someone. So they didn't do the same thing that, that we've done in the rest of, you know, of the Western countries and Europe. Uh, thank you. The uh, coming week, um, there's a week-long meeting uh, with a World Health Organization. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has its Conference of the Parties meeting number eight. COP, what does it stand for? Conference of the Parties. And the parties are the 181 ratified signatories to the convention. And obviously, it seems they want to keep this meeting secret. Yeah. A quick recap on that is um, INCO, the global organization collecting uh, consumer organization, grassroots organization for users around the world. We were accredited to the UN this year for the high level meeting on non communicable diseases. And we then, of course, immediately realized that filed also to be an observer at this COP8 meeting in Geneva. And we were frankly quite shocked when we saw that we were recommended to be rejected, basically banished from even observing and reporting what happens and what goes on. So yes, I would, I would say that you're right. I heard now that uh, quite a number of brave women and men are actually moving, going to Geneva. Yes. Uh, next week. Yes. And we will learn more about that. Uh, so stay tuned. And for all those delegates going to Geneva to attend the uh, COP meeting, just make be sure that uh, you will be focused on as well. It's, it's very concerning because this is really, you know, to exclude a consumer group, a global consumer group. They're representing millions of people. Yeah, the FCTC was established to protect exactly these people yeah. from smoking harms and to exclude them from even observing the meeting is a breakdown in democracy and in democratic process. So, uh, and we see this around the world as well, yeah. that, that there is a breakdown in democratic process, there's a breakdown and a denial of citizenship and that's what's happening and it's inappropriate and the countries that are there, I hope that they 
particularly New Zealand, um, objects to ENCO being you know, uh, disallowed from observing, just observing. Yeah, we hope so too. And I'm an optimist, so uh, uh, go for it. How come you have traveled uh, across the whole world to, to visit Sweden? You, you must let uh, the supporters of EU Force News and, and vaping and uh, heat up burn. You have to tell them why are you in Sweden? Well, I was invited to join a study tour of Japan to look at the uh, extraordinary uptake of heated tobacco products there. As I said, 27% uh, of, the, yeah, of the tobacco smoking market in two years. So we haven't seen that anywhere else that fast. So uh, I joined a group of experts, including Ricardo Pelosi uh, and Delon Human and Christopher Russell. Yeah. And we, you know, we went and had a look at that issue. So that was very interesting. So Japan, and I was also uh, booked to talk at the Global Tobacco and Nicotine Forum in London. Yeah. So I went on to that, and we talked about our, our observations and learnings from Japan. And I was also on a panel talking about ideal regulatory framework for harm reduction and massive quitting. And then, uh, because I was in London, I was close to the Tobacco Harm Reduction Summit that was occurring in Barcelona, so I also flew over to speak there. And, and because I was here, I decided to come up and see you guys to learn more about SNUS hands, hands-on, uh, and you know, observe, and yep, it's been, uh, I've, my head is bursting, I've learned so much. We, we might hear more news yes. later on, I yeah. guess. Well, one of the interesting things I learned that I didn't know before was that there is one product, a SNUS product, that has no nicotine and no tobacco. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's got no to tobacco and it's got no nicotine. And that people who are maybe switch to SNUS and then later on they want to get off SNUS, it's kind of like a... In our team. Like, like a dummy for yeah for, for to babies. help them quit. I mean, this is great. Perhaps the same uh, people baking and, and ultimately shift down to well, zero uh, nicotine, they, zero nicotine, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. ultimately quit. Yeah, and I think that that's sort of important for people who who are concerned. Oh, but well, you're just exchanging one addiction for another, but. What we do see with vaping, many people, as you just said, they go on to vaping, then they lower their nicotine, they go on to no nicotine, and then they mm. eventually quit. And I didn't realize that there were products to enable people to do that with SNUS as well. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had uh, EU for SNUS had an interview uh, in the uh, beginning of August with Dr. Lars Romström. Uh, who have concluded he has a, a, a cohort, a, a population data from about 66,000 people covering uh, eight years, and he concluded that uh, 86 to 87 percent of all switching to snooze were are former smokers. But the interesting thing is that doesn't seem to be a gateway into smoking because later on uh, about one third of these going from smoking to snooze ultimately quit using snooze as well mm -hmm. and I think also uh, Professor Brad Rodeau of uh, USA as well as uh, Carly Liglund of the Nordic Absolutely. Norwegian Health Institute, I guess, yeah. have come to similar conclusions. The, an interesting extra point uh, with regards to Lars Ramstrom, Dr. Ramstrom, is that um, for both men and women, surprisingly, very surprising, both men and women have a 16 month smoke free rate of over 70%. Yeah. That is 10 times best case NRT. Have you tried snooze? No. No? <laughs> Do you dare? No. 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 That's good. You you don't use nicotine. No, any I nicotine don't, I don't. at all. No, but um, I can try the one that has no tobacco, no nicotine. Right. Yeah, but I haven't.
I didn't bring that today. <laughs> but there is one thing, though, that I'm curious about, which I think you agree with. That it, when we when we eliminate the spot and we get smokers on to rel relevant harmful products, whether they then go on to become complete non-users or continue using the non-users, are we sort of in agreement that that should not really be a focus for public health? That's no longer their remit as a public health. I don't think that 100% of people are going to stop smoking. I think uh, that there will always be a subculture, if you like, or a market. You know, we've got a long way to go. It's a big world, and some countries are only just starting at the beginning of their tobacco epidemic. Um, you know, there's, there are the Anglo-Western countries, there's Europe, um, and we are at the end of our tobacco epidemic, but there are many countries in the world who are really just at the beginning. And there's much, much less effort being in research and focus on, on them and on helping them uh, in a culturally appropriate way. I mean, just telling them to do exactly what they've done in Europe is ridiculous and not going to work. So. Uh, I don't believe that in my lifetime everyone in the world will stop smoking. Um, there's, you know, there are people with particular um, psychiatric disorders, and I don't know that we have products that can totally substitute the smoking for them. There will be some people who want to smoke, and there will be some people who just never can that no other product does it for them. That I completely agree with. Uh, my question was more along the lines of when we move people from smoking to the really harm reduced products, should we leave them after that and let them make their own choices whether to carry on with the entire? I don't think that it's going to be a public health priority. Um, when there are so many other pressing priorities, mental health, um, suicide rates, obesity, um, alcohol, you know, there are many other health harming behaviours and products or diseases that should be focused on. And at the moment even, the amount of money going into tobacco control is not paying off and I think what we'll start to see is many countries moving that money to a different area. Uh, well, for me it's pure pleasure. I hope you will be back in Sweden. Um, my pleasure. Uh, it, <laughs> beautiful country, really beautiful and beautiful city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.